the best example I can think of is being boozled from Jelly Belly. And what they do is they take these hor- horrendous flavors and they mix them in with good flavors. Oh, like what? <laughs> uh, like rotten egg and canned dog food. And- oh! <laughs> I know. I'm Robin Sessingham, and this is The Zest. Citrus, seafood, Spanish flavor, and southern charm. We're all about food in Florida. He's a real-life Willy Wonka. Meet the man who created Jacksonville's over-the-top candy paradise, Sweet Pete's. I wanted to make sure that you know about stpetersburgfoodies.com. If you're looking for fun and good food in St. Pete, there are restaurant reviews and podcasts featuring local chefs, restaurateurs, happy hour suggestions, and a lot more. It's all online at stpetersburgfoodies.com. Peter Berenger and his wife, Allison, are the couple behind Sweet Pete's in Jacksonville. His three-story Shrine to Sugar is the largest candy store in the Southeast. But running a candy business isn't just about lollipops and chocolate bars. Pete recently spoke with Azest Leah Colon about the company's rocky road to success. He also shared the latest candy trends and ideas for treats that you can make at home. Thank you for doing this. What does your business card say? Does it just say, like, Willy Wonka? <laughs> candy man. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, I have to ask you, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Because I feel like every kid wants to be the candy man or the candy woman. Well, I, you know, I grew up in the business. I grew up, My uh, mother started a chocolate business here in Northeast Florida, and I was part of that growing up and learned a lot about chocolate and candy in the industry. And so I just always wanted to be doing something in that field. I always wanted to do something in that field. And so um, eventually I came back and started a business. Wow. So you grew up in Northeast Florida. I did. And then how did Sweet Pete's begin? What's that origin story? I was at my at the family business in, in here in Northeast Florida. And I was there for about 20 years. And during the last economic meltdown we had to bring on partners and we ultimately lost our family business which was you know was tough on us and we left with you know very little resources and we started a new company uh in a what we call a revitalization neighborhood at the time uh, just north of downtown jacksonville and we took the the money we could scrape together and we started another business and called it Sweet Pete's. We were in a sort of a non-traditional area where there wasn't a lot of foot traffic. So we had to be kind of innovative and in coming up with new ideas and, and ways to get people into the store. And we did, uh, we did, we started focusing on things like classes, parties, and field trips and things that are interactive that bring people into the candy making process. And so that's how we were able to grow a business on essentially a shoestring. And then in 2014, we we're on a show called The Profit. I did see that. You know, my husband loves that show. So when I saw that you were on there, I, I thought, I wonder if I've seen your episode. How did that come about? That's a guy named Marcus Lamonis, and he kind of helps businesses, what, go to the next level or work out the kinks? Yeah, I mean, there's different every time. There's a different scenario uh, in every episode. It could be that he's, you know, helping get a business on the right track. It, 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 there's a variety of things he excuse me a variety of reasons why he gets involved in our case we had to get rid of our partner because we just couldn't see eye to eye and it was a really tough situation because when you're in a small business and it's kind of a startup you're trying to put all the resources you can back into your business and and he was uh, just had a different idea of how of what he wanted from the business and it just didn't really work and we tried to buy him out we tried to do a lot of different things you know, so that we could move forward, but nothing seemed to work. And we're just sort of going around and around in circles and we couldn't really make any progress. So we didn't want to walk away from the business that we created that was you know, starting to find some real success. So we uh, just kind of put our heads together, just try to find out, you know, what what can we do to move forward? And it just so happened at the time, the uh, profit was our show that we'd watch as a family. And we thought, well, why don't we um, 
apply. And wow. so after getting home one day, after a few drinks, we filled out the application <laughs> and then the next day, <laughs> Grease the wheels. The next, <laughs> yeah. The next day we got a call back. We were shocked. Uh, we couldn't believe it. And then the rest is sort of history. We, we were on the show and he helped us get into a bigger location and expand our business. Wow. He also uh, bought out our partner, which was great because it, it, you know, it helped us. You know, it was kind of a win-win situation for everybody. And then we were able to move forward. Wow. So it really is a business. It's not just sitting in like a pool of marshmallows all day, the way we probably think of running a candy business. You mentioned that you are in a new building. So walk me through, I haven't gotten to go to Sweet Pete's in person, but believe me, you're on my bucket list. So paint a picture for me. What is the building like? What is the experience like of, of taking a tour of Sweet Pete's? Our, our first location was essentially just a house that we repurposed for a candy kitchen and a retail store. And so when we were looking for a new location in downtown Jacksonville, we, we wanted to be part of downtown because we wanted to help uh, revitalize the community. It was important to us to support the community. And we felt like a good way to do that was to be invested in downtown. And we there was a building that was called the Seminole Club. It's the, one of the oldest buildings in downtown Jacksonville. It's about 25,000 square feet. It was built in 1901, and I think it was completed in 1903. Um, it was an older, it, it, was a, it was a club for city leaders and politicians and people like that. And it had been abandoned for about 10 years. And so what we wanted to do is create the biggest and most impressive candy store that anybody's ever seen and, and cr- just fill the place with candy, put a restaurant in and um, just be able to do things on a higher level that we were doing in the old place. Like for example, bring in bigger field trips, more classes and parties and field trips, make the experience even more interactive. And so when you come into Sweet Pete's, you see it's a revitalized building that we've repurposed for a candy purpose. You come in and, and um, we have a, a store on the first floor, a retail store, and you can come up the, there's a big staircase. You come up to the second floor and there's a dessert bar. There's all kinds of candy, bulk candy, and also a little area where you can walk out and see our production floor. So anybody can come in and watch us make candy. We also uh, have a third floor that's dedicated to events and our, it's where we put on most of the classes and the parties and field trips and things like that. So it's a big building that just encompasses a lot of different activities and things. It's sort of like a candy wonderland. We wanted, we created sort of this candy fantasy that we can bring everybody into. So the building itself looks like a palace or a mansion. It's like you're really giving candy the respect it deserves. And I was thinking about that because as an adult, I won't buy candy for myself, but like I'll eat my kids Halloween candy since I'm sure. te- I'm teaching them at home, we use M&Ms to do math. And at night, I'll like sneak and have some of their M&Ms. Why do you think that is? Why do you think adults don't just admit that we like candy? <laughs> some of us still do. Um, <laughs> uh, I, You know, I think because we're kind of shamed out of it, perhaps. But I think there's, there's no shame in loving candy. It, to me, it takes me back to my childhood. There's a certain magic associated with it. and But I think there's this shame of adults, you know, and enjoying candy for some reason. And I think it's unfortunate. We try to break that down when we're here. I think, you know, it's just one of those things that makes, makes you happy, makes people happy. So I, I think it's okay to love candy as an adult. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, what's the secret to running a candy business and not like eating all of the profits? Are you sick of candy or, or do you still uh, enjoy never. it? Never. I just, I, hopefully I, I try not to eat it too much uh, and I don't take it home with me. Oh, that's good. <laughs> you don't take work home with you. Do you have kids? No. I have a son who is uh, 17. He probably grew up in this business like you. Sure. What's the key to enjoying candy with your kids or what's the key to moderating your kids candy intake because we want to celebrate it but we don't want cavities you know all that boring well, stuff. In our case, well that's tough i mean in our case you know it's a treat it's not something you should eat you shouldn't eat it like um every day every meal that sort of thing i think it's i think it has to be enjoyed responsibly <laughs> it's kind of, it reminds me of how french people 
let their kids drink wine with dinner and then their kids don't get drunk and then american kids are restricted from <laughs> alcohol and like want to have it as soon as they can get their hands on it <laughs> that's probably true like, um it takes away the power yeah i mean it just i, I think that um too that yeah, exercise and getting staying on your feet and, and being active i think that's probably the most important thing you can do and not worry about how much candy you eat You've been in this business since you were a kid. You said your mom had a candy store in Jack in the Jacksonville area. That's right. In fact, we franchised it. We grew it to thirty three stores at one point, and we had uh, stores in Northeast Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina, and Alabama. Wow! What was it called? Uh, Peterbrook Chocolatier. Wow! Very cool. So what trends have you observed over the years? I know on your website, you have vegan candy. What other maybe unexpected iterations of candy have you seen since you were in this as a child? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is candy itself is becoming more extreme and experimental. So you have like extreme sour candy and things like that, where um, you know people are pushing the boundaries of the flavors. Um, and they've come up with products like warheads and toxic waste. And so there was this very, um, very popular amongst kids and also, um, surprisingly adults too. And then you see it like in the jelly beans, the best example I can think of is being boozled from jelly belly. And what they do is they take these horrendous flavors and they mix them in with good flavors. Oh, like what? (laughs) Um, like rotten egg and canned dog food. And... Oh, <laughs> I know. Oh, I can like feel that in the back of my mouth as you say it. I thought the popcorn flavor was kind of like pushing the limits. Wow, yeah. why would but you people do that? Coming up with that, and, and that's just—it's sort of a fun game that kids play, and uh, I guess adults play it too. But it's, um, yeah. You know, but there's a lot of extreme experimental flavors, and and I think. Another trend that I see in candy, just in general, is that it's, it's, they want to make it more snackable than it used to be. I mean, I think customers want a more snackable experience. You'll see, like, individual bite-sized pieces marketed now as opposed to eating a whole candy bar. Like, you still see the candy bar. I don't think the candy bar is ever going away, but I noticed that that's a, you know, it's a popular thing to have things that you can snack on. Yeah, and I'm still going to eat like a whole bag of the snack size. So it's, right, it's you just feel better about six of one, half good. dozen of the other. <laughs> now, has Which that... I think you're better off eating the candy bar because then you know, like, oh, I've had enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how have those changes affected the way you've run your business, or have they? Well, we've gone into a lot of bulk candy, so we have a huge candy selection where you can pick out just a wide variety of candy. Some of it we bring on, a lot of it we make, but it's convenient because people can fill these different containers and decide what they want. And it, it is snackable so that it works out very well. You can get as much or as little as you want and kind of mix and match and do whatever you want with it. And sort of sort of gives people the freedom to, to shop the way they want to shop. Since the pandemic began, have you noticed a change in orders from your website? Like are people craving more sweets now? Are they craving different types of sweets? I've sold... A lot more um, chocolate bars for some reason, custom chocolate bars, because we, we can do custom. So you can, you can go to our website and, and have it what we call chocolate bar your way, and you can have design it with whatever the toppings are you want to put on it. We sold a lot of that um, since the pandemic. And then we've also sold a lot of hard candy for some reason, a lot of lollipops. Hmm. So since everybody is pretty much staying home and we're all, (laughs) I mean, there was like the sourdough era of the pandemic and people, I've baked pretzels and people have sprouted their own seeds, (laughs) just like things we never thought we would do. So I never thought about making my own candy, but here we are. (laughs) What is a good, what's a good candy that beginners could make at home? A really good one is, and a fun one is marshmallow. Uh, Get a stand mixer and then... If you have that with a whisk attachment, you can make marshmallow. And the good thing about marshmallow is it's a great platform to make other flavors with. So you can put a few a fruit puree with it included into your marshmallow. And you can also 
do different flavors of uh, whatever flavor you want, really, you can make it in a marshmallow. It's fun to do. It's interesting to see because you're taking simple ingredients and you're making this marshmallow out of it. It's all essentially just sugar and water, glucose and gelatin. And these are all things you can buy in the grocery store. I never thought about making my own marshmallows. And that sounds like kind of science-y, which is good because I've got my kids at home with me. I can pretend like it's a science lesson and a snack. Sure. <laughs> There's a lot of science with candy. In fact, that's what our field trips are based on. We can we teach uh, science to elementary school kids using candy, and it's been an, an extraordinarily popular. How about one more? What's another easy one to make at home? Or maybe, I don't know if you share recipes, but, you know, something that people could play around with in their kitchen. You know, another good thing to do, if you learn how to temper chocolate, you can do all kinds of things with chocolate because you can dip pretzels or potato chips or perhaps marshmallow you just made. But there's unlimited things you can do with tempered chocolate. So that's another good one. Hard candy. You can make hard candy and, and pour it into uh, silicone molds and create different colors and flavors. Um, a lot of these are available at the grocery store. You can go to a website like Loran Oils, for example, and you can get the supplies you would need for that. And it's a fun thing to do. It's a, you know, because when you make candy and you're with your family, it's just, it's, it's fun times. That does sound fun. And I bet I would eat less of it because I would re like respect the process. <laughs> like don't eat all of those marshmallows. That took me two days or whatever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this was fun. Can we end with a little lightning round? What is your favorite candy bar? My favorite candy bar, the, the one that we do that's the, we call the pretzel thing. I, I like it with, um, it's got actually gluten free pretzels and also sea salt caramel and milk chocolate. Mm, that sounds right up my alley. What candy can you not stand? The worst candy I've ever tried in my life is salty black licorice. It's very popular in some parts of the world. I don't know why. It's terrible. It's so salty that it makes you your mouth water and then you bite into it and it's this very pungent and very uh, pronounced black licorice flavor and it's it's rough. Ooh, black licorice is very polarizing. So is candy corn. What are your thoughts on candy corn? Candy, candy corn's okay. Uh, my son loves it. I just sort of grew out of it. Uh, I don't like it that much anymore. What wine would go best with Reese's peanut butter cups? Which wine? Mm-hmm. Wow. I would say, well, I would say a glass of scotch, but uh, if I was picking a <laughs> wine, <laughs> um, it would be probably a Gewürztraminer. Okay. Best movie theater candy? M&M's. Mm, in a box or a bag? I like the bag. Interesting choice. <laughs> what is the best trick-or-treating candy? Anything that's the little candy bars are the best. Any of the assorted candy bars, I think, are the best. Mm -hmm. How about your favorite jelly bean flavor? Or if you made up your own jelly bean flavor? I mean, excluding dog food. What would you say is your favorite? My favorite jelly bean flavor that we sell is guava, and it's great. Oh, that sounds so Florida. That sounds really <laughs> refreshing. <laughs> it is. That was Delia Cologne speaking with Peter Beringer of Sweet Pete's in Jacksonville. You can find Pete's recipes for homemade marshmallows and hot fudge on our website, thezestpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. And if you've got a friend that would love to hear about what's cooking in Florida, please share the podcast and come connect with us. We're on Facebook at The Zest Podcast. I'm Robin Sessingham. Delia Cologne and I produce The Zest with help from Cheyenne Jaglal and Mark Hayes. Copyright 2020, WUSF Public Media, University of South Florida.